Hello? Can you guys hear me? Hi, happy Friday, everyone. I'm glad you guys can hear me. <laughs> we have an exciting presentation today from Danielle Walden, who actually passed her CIC exam. But let me make sure I'm sharing my screen since we've been through this before. Okay, are y'all able to see the, the screen? Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, it is two o'clock, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, very happy to see some new people joining us here today. Ashley Freeman, she's from Hillsborough County, so welcome to the group. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so our agenda for today, we're going to go over Danielle's guide to successfully passing the CIC exam, chapter 10, 11, and 12, also our group member spotlight, and next week assignments. So first order of business, congratulations to Danielle Walden. She is our newest team member in Orange County to be certified in infection prevention and control. As you can see here, we decorated her desk because uh, we were really excited about her passing. We know it's like really stressful to sign up for the exam and to take it. Um, funny fact, I actually bought her balloons before her exam was over because I was that confident that she was going to pass. So we have a lot of faith here in each other, in our team members. Um, but let's just learn a little bit about her. She graduated in 2012 with a Bachelor of Science in Preclinical Health Sciences from UCF. She also graduated from Tulane in 2014 with an MPH in Global Community Health and Behavioral Sciences. She lived in Hong Kong from 2014 to 2017 and worked at the Chinese University of Hong Kong at the Center for Health Behaviors Research. And her research areas of interest were internet addiction, organ donation, and mental health. And we can see her right here. This is our little Walden right in this picture. Um, so before she actually became our infection control assessment and response epidemiologist, she did work as a CNA in high school, but really the majority of her education was really tailored to behavioral, uh, behavioral health and education. Um, so she really didn't have a ton of experience in infection prevention and control, which is just amazing because she was just hired in March of 2018 and she's already certified. So I think it really speaks volumes about just who she is as a person and her dedication to the field of infection prevention and control. Um, as far as her extracurricular activities, um, she has a dog. Her name is Coda. She's beautiful. She's three years old. I've met her in person. She bit me once. It was not her fault. I went into her space without, um, you know, asking for permission. So it was really, it was my fault. She nipped me. It was not, it was not a serious bite. You guys don't be concerned. Um, and then she was a cheerleader for UCF. So that's very cool. She's a Harry Potter nerd and she's a Ravenclaw. Uh, she went to the New Zealand set of the Lord of the Rings, even though she's not a Lord of the Rings fan. So I don't know if I can forgive her for that because I love the Lord of the Rings. This is a picture of her in Thailand, and this, this is her this is her dragon boating. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it off to her so she can talk to you a little bit about what her experience was like preparing for the exam. And so here's Danielle. Thank you, Luz, for that great introduction. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. I'm just gonna go quickly through what I did to prepare for my exam. I know you all have a jam-packed schedule today, so I won't take up too much of your time, but I do wanna give you um, some study tips that I did, and as well as like lessons that I learned that hopefully can be helpful to you all as well. So to explain, my initial purpose um, in general was originally for my professional develop when it, development when I originally got hired on here as the infection control assessment and response epidemiologist. But as I started going out into the field more and more and talking with infection preventionists from different acute care hospitals and talking with directors of nursing from long-term care who are in charge of infection prevention and control at um, 
nursing homes and ALFs. I, it, my purpose for getting the CIC kind of changed from my professional development to, to better be able to serve as a reliable resource for our healthcare facilities um, in Orange County where I work. I really wanted to be on the same playing field as these IPs who had their CIC. I wanted to be able to um, provide them recommendations um, from another CIC professional. So, um, and just bridge that gap between public health and healthcare. So I guess my purpose kind of changed overall, but it was just, in the end, it was just to make our, our county and our healthcare facilities better and to act as more of a resource for them. So here's a description of my initial study plan. As Luz mentioned, in February, I was hired on. It was towards the end of February. Um, and then March 2018 is when I started in her CIC study group in cohort one. And then in April of 2018, I started participating in Patty's Washington CIC study group. And I really enjoyed both of these. They were very different. Uh, most of you know Luz is, is more lecture-based. Um, interactive, um, and it's different platforms of, of learning through videos and, and lectures and questions, whereas Patty's is just more strictly study-based, but I think both were extremely helpful. Um, in June, that's when I actually registered and signed up for the exam, and this was kind of the turning, more of the turning point for me as a motivation for studying because I knew as soon as I signed up, I only had 90 days to take it. Um, so that's really when I started like um, taking the study plan Luz had developed and really going through it. So, I mean, realistically, I know some of you all might be worried that you don't have enough time or something like that, but realistically, if you look at my study plan when I actually seriously sat down and started studying, I mean, it was 90 days. So don't get discouraged if if it's you're not picking it up right away or anything like that. But And maybe some of you are like me where you need that extra motivation and you need to register, you know. Um, it is a lot of money, so I also didn't want to waste my money um, by not passing. So uh, that was another motivation for me as well. When I originally signed up, Patty suggested that to take a full practice exam. And when I took that first practice practice exam, I got a 56. Luz has told me that some of you um, were are in the same scoring range as me with your first practice exam and are a little discouraged, but please don't get discouraged at all. You know, this is a great opportunity for you to see where your weakest areas are and where your strongest areas are. Um, so on average, I probably read four to seven chapters a week. Um, this is uh, following Luz's CIC study plan. And then in addition to that, I read specific chapters as it related to my upcoming site visits to healthcare facilities in my job description. So if I was going out to an acute care hospital and um, going to see an endoscopy procedure. Before I went to the facility, I would read endoscopy, but I would also read on reprocessing and cleaning and sterilization and things like that. So um, I did follow her plan, but as it relates to my job, I also um, read additionally on top of that. So two weeks prior to the exam is when I took my second practice exam. And if I recall, that one um, was around a 72%. Um, and from talking with Luz previously, she always told me to shoot for 75, at least 75. So at least from the time I took that first exam back in June till when I, two weeks prior to the exam, you know, I had gone up about 20 or 15, 15 to 18, I don't know the math in my head right now, but you know, uh, percentage points. Um, so that actually really helped me a lot two weeks going into the exam. I was really discouraged thinking, I still haven't read all these chapters. I don't know if I'm ready to take this exam. But then I took that practice exam and seeing that I had gone up that much and was in the 70% um, was really a confidence booster and that extra kind of motivation to keep studying and to keep going on. In that two weeks, though, I did focus less on reading the chapters and more on the practice questions and then specifically reading those explanations after the questions. And the reason I did that is because when I took multiple practice exams, I found that um, a lot of the topics were 
similar, you know, like hepatitis or um, uh, microbiology and like those kind of different chapters. So I, Immunization. immunizations, yeah. So, you know, I, I found it more helpful for me to take those practice questions and then read every single explanation because not only did it give me the explanation of why the answer was it what it was but it also most of the time gave the answer of why it wasn't the other three answers so that was really helpful as well um, for those that I didn't get a chance to read the chapters I focused on going over the tables because uh, those really highlighted the most important points in the chapters specifically kind of like immunization um, when they should be immunized and um, like in the pregnancy chapter, uh, whether there's contraindications or not. So instead of reading those texts, because I didn't have time, I focused on those tables. Um, and I'm kind of more of a visual visual learner. So it helped me to be able to flash back when I was taking the test to see, okay, this is, this is where I remember seeing it. Um, the Saturday, so I took the test on a Monday. That Saturday before the exam, I took another uh, practice test for myself. And again, just went through those that I missed and read the explanations to that. Um, on the day of the test, I, I'm a morning person. So I took it at 8 a.m. in the morning. Luz is afternoon, so she took hers in the afternoon. So just know your your strengths and weaknesses. Know when you're most awake. And I would recommend scheduling that, um, scheduling the test during that time that you know that you're most productive. So my most beneficial tools, uh, my most helpful, I think, was the study guide, the APIC certification study guide and that was because it really gave me an opportunity to see how the questions were going to be worded and then again I can't emphasize enough the explanations and really just reading through those and not just saying I miss this I miss that or something you know um, the other helpful tools and these are in no they're in alphabetical order so it's not that I you know picked one over the other um, but the APIC text volume one through three um, I think it's important for you guys to know that I didn't read the, all the books, and I'm not saying that you should not read them, but also I read about 50% of the book. But on top of that, um, my, you know, my current position requires me to read a lot of evidence-based guidelines and regulations. I also have hands-on experience going to different facilities and stuff, so I think that also contributed um, to me studying and learning. Um, so. The first book, the blue book, was the one that I felt was the most helpful, um, and then followed by the 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 yellow book, the big the big yellow book. Um, you know, environmental cleaning, construction, um, laundry, all of those types of chapters um, were were extremely important for my exam, at least. Um, <clears throat> and then, as I mentioned before, the the two study groups that I participated in. So some lessons learned that I hope can help you is my biggest thing was focused on your weakest areas. I knew, as Luz mentioned, that I came from behavioral health science. So my biggest strengths was the research chapters and um, communication and management. And I think where I made the mistake was I always focused on those because that's what interests me. So anytime I ever went back to the studying or drawing board, you know, I always focused on those chapters because that's what I was good at. And when it came down to the test time, I did feel like I lacked a little in those that um, were my weakest areas because I didn't want to study those because <laughs> I didn't know them as well. So if I could say anything, just push past it and make sure that you focus on those weak areas. Complete multiple practice questions to get used to the format. They all, they're asked in different kinds of ways. One of the trickiest ones that I came across was they ask you a question and say, what is the first thing that you should do? Or what is the most important thing to do first? And this is where, and it goes into my next point of thinking like an IP and thinking logically. You know, um, for your, the EPIs out there, you might think a different way than than an IP would. So you really have to put yourself in that situation, and you really have to think like, okay, what is the most important thing to do to do first? You know, because some of it could be multiple answers, but um, 
you know, and and they go into that a little in, in the textbooks and things like that. So just paying attention uh, to those details. Also, don't just memorize things. You need to be able to apply what you've learned to specific um, contexts and things like that. Um, they will, you know, as Luz has mentioned, they will have definitions, but they seem to really like those applications. So being able to think in that kind of mind frame as well. Using different methods for studying. I pers participated in the two group sessions. I also studied by myself. Um, through reading, through listening. I can't tell you how many times I was on my way home from work. I live, I work in Orlando and live in Sanford. For those of you who don't know, that's like an hour drive. So I would listen to her um, study sessions while I was driving in the car um, just to pass the time. Um, writing things down for those who like flashcards. I like to write things, especially, um, you know, um, equations and stuff for those uh, sensitivity, specificity, things like that, uh, watching videos. And then um, importantly too, is just surround yourself with a good support system. I know all of you had to submit an application with your boss's um, uh, support on it. Um, so just, you know, surrounding yourself with those people and not just your boss, but your colleagues. And, you know, I had a really great support support system here with um, my colleagues helping me study and even people at home. You know, I recruited my my family members and significant others to read questions to me and things like that. So um, just making sure that you have that support system as well. And that is all. So if you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to to answer any. And I hope uh, you all found that helpful, some of the tips that I learned from it. And I wish you all the best of luck. And I know you all can do it. Luz is a great teacher. So um, I can't wait to see how many of you all become CIC after this group. So good luck to you all. All right, guys, does anyone have any questions for her? Uh, so Maria from Osceola said, thank you, Danielle. How did you sign up for the Washington CIC study group? Uh, um, the way that you sign up for that is you actually got to email Patty Montgomery, and I can send out her email address um, after this session. And Francis says, congrats. And Carrie Harder says, thank you. That was helpful. So. Um, people found that helpful. Thanks, Danielle. You're the greatest. All right, guys. So let's keep it moving. Okay, so some reminders. Uh, so believe you can and you're halfway there. Like Danielle said, if you really want to get this certification and if this is something that's important to you, then you can absolutely do it. I don't want you guys being discouraged because some of you may be getting low scores on the module practice questions or on your practice exam. Don't be discouraged. You know, this is why we're getting together and why we're studying um, is to try to improve those scores. Um, you only get out what you put in. So if you're kind of just listening in on Fridays and you're not doing your, you know, the assigned readings or taking the time to watch some of those extra lectures that I'm sending, you probably won't get as much out of this group as others who are actually doing all of their readings, trying to watch the additional videos, because you're only really gonna get out what you put in. So just take that into consideration. Um, you know, I do the group member spotlight to really highlight on the different members that we have in our group, but to also show you that we all have different priorities. We all have family members, pets, children, um, different things in our lives that are important. But if, you know, if this certification is something that you really want, then there, there does need to be a little bit of compromise and um, you know some scheduling that will need to that will need to take place for the next couple of weeks while you're preparing um, participation is important so just you know I have a lot of I have a pretty solid group of people that are coming every week but just making sure that you're trying your best to, to make it um, every Friday and that you're also trying to participate during the lesson so that you're actually you know answering questions and taking the time to 
really think about it and you know participate and put in those answers and always 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 keep your why in mind you know why are you pursuing this certification why is it important to you we all have different reasons for some of us it's professional development you know for others it's a requirement for you know for your position or for your job um, you know I view the CIC as as something that essentially means that you were dedicated enough to really learn about those gold standards in infection control and to have a really great baseline of an understanding of an infection control program and all of its different components. Um, and I view it as a commitment that you're making to yourself and your community that you are going to try your best uh, to, to keep them safe. And so always keep that in mind. Why is this certification important? Why do you want to do it? Uh, because I, I think it will help to keep you motivated as you prepare for this exam. So speaking of homework, so your homework for this week was to read uh, chapters 12, 11, and 12. Oh, sorry, we have a quick question. Where do we find the full practice exams? So um, I do not have the full practice exams available. Um, Patty Montgomery does have them available on her Google Drive. So I can um, send you her email so that you're able to get access to her study group um, so that you can um, get the, the practice exams from her Google Drive. Okay, hopefully that answers that question. Okay, um, and then once again, we, we had those three chapter readings that we needed to do for this week. So let's get started. So what is epidemiology, right? We have a couple different definitions here. And so epi is the Greek meaning on or upon, demos, Greek, the Greek meaning for people, and then logos, for, for the study of. So in other words, the word epidemiology has its roots in the study of what befalls a population, right? So we're looking at populations. Uh, the CDC states that epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states or events in specified populations and the application of the study to the control of health problems. So once again, we're really focusing on what befalls a population. Now, as far as APIC, um, epidemiology is the study of the frequency, distribution, cause, and control of disease in populations, and it forms the basis of all health-related studies. So when you have this definition, the study of the frequency, distribution, cause, and surveillance of disease in populations, um, that is, epidemiology is going to be your answer. So you're just going to want to make sure that um, that you have this one memorized. Um, you know, like I said, there are going to be a lot of different definitions and a lot of different, um, you know, tools accessible to you so that you're able to really understand this material. However, for the purpose of the exam, you just want to make sure that you have the APIC textbook definitions um, readily accessible in your memory for when you're taking the exam because these are the definitions they're going to use when they're asking you questions. Um, it provides the background for interventions to reduce transmission of infecting organisms, reduce the number of healthcare associated infections, and protect healthcare providers from infection. Okay, so epidemiology aids in the understanding of the cause of a disease by knowing its distribution, determinants in the term of person, place and time and the natural history. So this is going to be very um, easy for some of us epis because we are literally always being drilled this by our managers and also by our schools, you know, person, place, time. Like this is something that is very easy for us to remember. And I feel like this um, module two is going to be one of the easier ones, especially for our epidemiologists. However, it is my experience that a lot of infection preventionists struggle with module two because there are a lot of epidemiological concepts which they may not have um, really thoroughly reviewed in their in their degree programs. So if you did nursing, you know, you don't have entire classes dedicated to epidemiology and uh, biostatistics. That is more for our MPH people, right? And so I feel that this might be a little bit more of a challenging section for our IPs. So just make sure that if there are concepts you're not understanding, um, that you're really trying to find ways to, to make sure that you're able to understand the concepts and not just know it. So person, um, wait, I'm sorry, loose the definitions for place and time are inverted on this slide. Place and time. 
That is correct. Yes, I will fix this before I send it out. I apologize. OK, so for person, you have an individual characteristics that led to disease. Uh, place would be where, where the exposure occurred. <laughs> And time it would be when, when the exposure occurred. So thank you, Stephanie, for letting me know. So the always remember person, place, and time. All right, so the three Ds of epidemiology, distribution, determinants, and deterrence. So with the distribution, we want to really understand how disease is distributed, right? The assumption that a disease is not a random event is kind of a big purpose or a, a big underlying concept in epi. You know, we, we don't really believe that diseases are these, you know, that they occur at random and that, that they're these random events, right? Determinants are what factors cause disease, right? Or what, what factors cause diseases to increase or decrease decrease. So you're looking at factors that can give us clues as to the cause of a disease and these can be called risk factors or risk regulators. And then deterrence, we want to understand either factors that can prevent disease, reduce disease, or cure disease, right? So this is, these are the kind of the three D's for epi of epidemiology, distribution, determinants, and deterrence. Some key concepts, um, you want to understand the elements involved in the transmission of infections agents because it really enables IPs to develop strategies that target specific areas in their process, right? So this is part of the, the APEC text. So this is why they want to ensure that you're understanding epi concepts. Um, they also want to make sure that you're able to select the appropriate study design. And this is going to be covered more in the research and study design chapter, which I believe may be chapter 20. Um, and so they want to make sure, based on the information that you have, do you know what kind of study you would need to conduct or would be applicable based on that data that you're collecting or that you have available to you. Uh, and then also correct presentation of data to demonstrate outcomes and relationships in a manner that will likely encourage collaboration and support among stakeholders. So this is really about making sure that as an infection preventionist, you're able to get your data, your ideas across the table and people are able to understand them clearly. So, you know, you don't want to have really convoluted uh, you know charts um, and and things that people cannot understand you want to make sure that that when you're displaying your data that it's very easy to to understand um, this is a recommendation of how the ghost map helped end a killer disease and this is about cholera uh, and I think I watched it it was a really great video it's about 10 minutes so if you guys you know have some time and you're interested in learning a little bit more about epidemiology I think it would be a great video for y'all to watch. So background of epi, uh, the infectious disease process is a set of complex interrelationships of agent, host, and environment. Um, and it's been studied by epis for more than a century. Epidemiology as a discipline incorporates the use of statistics to determine associations and test hypotheses. This second bullet point is all of chapter 13. If you want to do well in module two, so in this section of the exam, you need to know chapter 13, backwards, frontwards, upside down, you need to have that chapter very well understood and all the concepts in that chapter very well understood because the majority, I feel like the majority of your questions are going to come from chapter 13. Um, unlike clinical medicine, Epidemiology is population-based and it's useful for describing health-related phenomena in groups of people, right? So population. So the agent would be what? So the agent can be a bacteria, virus, fungus, protozoan, helminth, or a prion, right? Uh, the environment would be where? So where where is this occurring, right? And the host is who? The host in the majority of our cases is going to be a human, specifically, um, you know, specifically when we're dealing with HAIs, right? So association, uh, association, this is 
this is a concept that you may have a question or two on the exam. Um, you have had questions about it on your first practice exam, and there are some other questions on association throughout uh, throughout the remainder of the book. So let's just talk a little bit about association. So association occurs if, as one variable changes, there is a concomitant or a resultant change in the quantity or quality of another variable, right? So when a statistical association between a factor and a disease has been demonstrated, there can be three types of association. So artifactual or spurious, indirect or non-causal or causal. Um, so let's start with the first one, which is artifactual association or spurious. Spurious? Spurious. Okay. Can you guys tell me what that word stands for or what it means? We're not only practicing for the CIC, we're also practicing for the GRE today. So So I have error, I have false. So not being what it purports to be, false or fake. Very good. So artifactual associations can be caused by errors in the study design or analysis leading to the introduc introduction of systemic error or bias, right? So failure to control for confounding variables in the study or analysis can result in artifactual association. As far as, far as um, indirect or non-causal, this, this can result from the mixing of effects between the exposure, the disease, and a third factor factor or confounding variable that may be associated with the exposures and independently affect the outcome of interest, right? And so you you have this here, right? So once again, artificial errors in study design or analysis, bias, um, failure to control for confounding variables, for indirect, you have mixing of effects between the exposure and disease, and confounding variable that may be associated with the exposure and independently affect the outcome of interest. And then causal occurs when evidence indicates that one factor is clearly shown to increase the, po the probability of the occurrence of a disease, but it's not the same as causality, right? You cannot confuse a causal type of association with causality because causality requires a number of conditions to be met, right? One of those conditions is the presence of a causal association, but they are not the same thing, right? So I'm hoping I'm making that clear. Causal association and causality are not the same thing. So some of you may remember this from one of the questions that you had, Bradford Hill's criteria for association. So Bradford, Bradford Hill's criteria for association basically are nine different types of criteria which are allow you to to see if it meets the the causal right association and so you have the strength of association so the stronger the relation between a risk factor and the effect or outcome the less likely it is that the relationship is due to a third or extraneous factor and so this is going to have to do with your odds ratios correct so if you have a higher odds ratio you have a stronger um, association. Consistency, you have multiple studies in a range of settings which report similar reports. So you're not basing it off just one, you know, just one paper that you read, which is telling you, oh, you know, gel nail polish is not a bad thing. You're, you're making sure that there's consistency, that there are multiple studies in a range of settings that report very similar results. Specificity, this is ideally the effect has only one cause. Temporality, the purported cause should be present before the effect occurs. Then we have biological gradient, which is the dose response, so a dose response relationship between the risk factor and the effect. Uh, biological plausibility, that there should be a rational and theoretical basis explaining how or why the risk factor led to the effect. Coherence, the association should not conflict with known facts. Experimental evidence, is there any supportive research based on experiment? If preventative action is taking, taken, does the effect dissipate? And then lastly, um, criteria number nine is analogy. A previously accepted phenomenon in one area can be applied to another. So Bradford Hill's, Bradford Hill's criteria for association, the way you're going to get asked about this in questions is they'll basically give you an example right of one of these different types of criteria and then they'll have you kind of figure out um you know what which one is it is it strength of association consistency temporality or they may tell you 
uh, you know, based on based on these different types of criteria, does this, uh, you know, does this idea or does this um, concept fit with Bradford Hill criteria for association, right? It's a lot. I had to read this multiple times to make sure I was really understanding it. Um, and I also watched three separate videos on Bradford Hill's criteria. And so um, I put them in the order of kind of usefulness. This last one by UNC is very, very thorough, uh, almost a little too thorough. Like they they teach you a lot, um, but I would recommend the first two. And if you're, you know, if if you really want to make sure you know it 100%, then watch the UNC one. It's it's a bit longer, but um, it's definitely helpful. So let's let's look at an example of Bradford Hills criteria for association. So an example is a challenge to the causal association of smoking and lung cancer, and this is from the APIC text. The tobacco industry maintains that the association between smoking and lung cancer is the result of some yet-to-be-defined variable and that the association with smoking is only a spurious result. The tobacco industry uses the argument that not all people who develop lung cancer are smokers. However, epidemiological research and analyses of many studies by Dahl and Pito have demonstrated that smoking meets Hill's criteria for causality of lung cancer and a number of other diseases. So you can see here how you're trying to look at Bradford's Hill criteria when it comes to the argument of smoking causes lung cancer and you can apply that Bradford's Hill criteria to a lot of different um, to a lot of different arguments. So moving on to the levels of prevention now we have primary secondary and tertiary levels of prevention and then here we have kind of the the progression of, of disease right so we have no disease we have the onset and asymptomatic um, stage clinical diagnosis and clinical course so for our levels of prevention for the primary prevention you, it's the complete prevention of a disease before any manifestation of that disease occurs right so we're in the no disease stage right here right so what are some examples of primary prevention wellness programs immunizations making sure moms are taking their you know their prenatals folic acid exercise um, which I need to do more of um, seat belts right so these are all different types of primary uh, prevention then we have the onset of disease and this is when we're moving into our secondary levels of prevention so this is early diagnosis and treatment and preventing further deterioration by interventions such as um, as early in the disease as possible. So this is going to be where your screenings are going to come in, right? So your your mammograms when you're looking for breast cancer, skin testing for TB. So these are some of your secondary levels of prevention. And even if you were to look at this in, in a chronic sense, right? So if you were looking at diabetes, so, you know, um, one of the ways or one of the secondary levels of prevention would really be just making sure that you're seeing your doctor and that you're getting blood work done regularly so that you're able to track all of those different um, you know factors that that could be putting you at risk and that's where that early diagnosis and treatment is really coming in right and then lastly is you know once you've made that clinical diagnosis and there's the clinical course you're moving into the tertiary levels of prevention which is really when you're going to try to reduce complications right so you have examples of rehabilitation and organ transplantation um, for in the example of my father he is a diabetic so um, he's been a diabetic for I don't know how many years but really you know what what we're aiming to do as a family is to make sure you know that he's eating healthy so to try to prevent from this disease of of causing him more complications you know he has his appointments with his doctors where they're making sure that his feet are okay and that everything is going well so that's where we have those levels of prevention right so now we have some questions so up here you have your word bank so these are all the answers for these different definitions and these are all from the APIC text okay so the first one is the number of existent cases of a given disease at a given time what would that be? The number of existent cases of a given disease at a given time. Mm, very good, very good. A lot of you had prevalence. Everyone had prevalence. Fabulous. 
Okay, the next one, an excess over the expected incidence of a disease, oh, sorry, of disease within a given geographical area during a specified time period. So once again, an excess over the expected incidence of disease within a, within a given geographical area during a specified time period. Oh, I see here we have, we have a lot of epidemics and outbreak. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Okay, well, the correct answer is epidemic. So, the next one. An epidemic spread over a wide geographical area across countries or continents. Very good, very good. Pandemic, that is correct. The next one is the usual incidence of a given disease within a geographical area during a specified time period. The incidence, the usual incidence of a given disease within a geographical area during a specified time period. Endemic is correct. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so funny you're like trying to change your answers it's okay it's okay we're all friends here uh the next one um this is a sudden increase in occurrences of a disease in a particular time and place oh yeah okay you guys all got this one outbreak and then the last one is incidence the number of new cases of a given disease in a given time period. Wonderful. So, if you guys haven't done so already, I would recommend, yes, I know for us, for a lot of us Epis and for, you know, for a lot of people on the call, this may be really basic, but you need to make sure that you know these definitions um, because these are the ones that are going to be on the test, okay? They use their own definitions from their APIC text. So, go home, make some study cards, or you can even just print out this slide and then and then just, you know, cover, cover the side with the answers on it um, to, to kind of help you. All right, the next, this is the next set. So we have reservoir, fomite, herd immunity, risk, and risk factor as our options. So the first one is the probability or likelihood of an event occurring. The probability or likelihood of an event occurring. Risk, very good. Next one, a place in which an infectious agent can survive but may or may not multiply. It may or may not multiply. Mm, yes, very good. Reservoir, that is correct. All right, the next one is a characteristic behavior or experience that increases the probability of developing a negative health status. A good example of this type of thing would be smoking, which we just talked about, right? A characteristic behavior or experience that increases the probability of developing a negative health status. Risk factor is correct, all right? An inanimate object on which organisms may exist for some period of time. We all know this one. <laughs> <laughs> Fomite, very good. And then the resistance of a group to invasion and to spread of an infectious agent based on the immunity of a high proportion of individual members of the group, that is herd immunity. Very good, guys. Very good. I hope that that was a, a confidence boosters for all you, uh, for all you guys because you guys did really good with those definitions. All right, so healthcare associated infections versus community acquired infections. So a healthcare associated infection is not present at the time of admission to the hospital or healthcare facility, but are temporally associated with admission to or a procedure performed in a healthcare facility. An infection that is present on admission may also be healthcare associated if it is related to a recent hospitalization, right? So this POA present on admission, Another thing that we need to keep in mind, right, is that this test was is really tailored and, and geared for our infection preventionists. So for us EPIs, terms such as present on admission, those NHSN definitions, those things are 
not going to come to us like like it's our second nature because we are not doing it every single day. For IPs, this is really where they have the upper hand because they're dealing with, with all of these terms every single day. So you guys need to really try to focus on what areas are you very strong in and not so strong in and making sure you're dedicating time to to strengthening those weaknesses, okay? Um, so that's kind of what uh, healthcare associated infection is per APIC definitions. And then a community acquired infections are infections that are present on admission with no association to a recent hospitalization, right? So they're just coming from the community, showing up at your facility, bada bing, bada boom, they have an infection, it's community acquired, it is not, you know, it's not a healthcare associated infection. All right, question one, a causal association, which remember, causal association and causality are not the same thing. A causal association is, one, a false association that can be due to chance or bias in study methods. Two, mixing of effects among exposures, disease, and a third factor that is associated with the exposure and independently affects the outcome. Three, when evidence indicates that one factor is clearly shown to increase the probability of occurrence of a disease. And four, determine through a set of criteria, including strength of identification, consistency, and biological plausibility. So I'm gonna give you guys a minute or two to read it. And it's a long question. Give you time to think about it. I don't wanna rush anybody. Okay, so I'm very, very impressed. Very impressed. The majority of you got this one correct. The answer is three and four. A causal association is when evidence indicates that one factor is clearly shown to increase the probability of occurrence of a disease and then determined through a set of criteria, including strength of identification, consistency, and biological plausibility. And that's going back to Bradford Hill's criteria, correct? Very good. Question two, which of the following is an example of the criterion of strength of association from Hill's criteria for causation? I'm gonna let you guys read through this one because it's a lot of reading and I don't want you guys to get sick of my voice. I already talk enough. So these answers were a little varied. We had a lot of different ones. We had some A's, some B's, some D's. I don't see any C's. So remember when I was talking about strength of association and I mentioned that the odds ratio is, is something that we're gonna be looking for when it comes to looking at our strength? Right, because the odds ratio is a statistical measure that is really gonna give us an indication of how strongly a risk factor um, is associated, right? So the correct answer here is A. In a study of the association between antibiotic exposure and development of C. diff infection, the odds ratio was two to three, right? So for option B, the authors the author's conclusions are consistent with those of three other studies. What would that be? That would be consistency, right? 
All right. Uh, antibiotic therapy began an average of three weeks before C. difficile infection. Wouldn't that be, that could possibly be temporal? Yeah, temporal, correct. And then the last one, prolonged antibiotic therapy was a greater risk factor for C. difficile infection. Which one would that one be? Greater risk factor. Let's see if Luce can remember. Let's see, greater risk factor. Where do we have our risk factors? Biological gradient. Okay, so do you guys see how they're gonna be asking you about Bradford Hill's criteria for association, right? So now you're starting to understand, oh man, I really do need to make sure that I know this and I'm gonna take Luce's advice and go home and watch one of these YouTube videos to make sure that I know it. Because guess what? These are straight from the APIC um, question, the certification study guide. All right, next one. An acute care facility experiences an outbreak of serratia marcescens, bloodstream infections. After the outbreak is under control and no new cases are being reported, the IP wants to find the source of the outbreak. The most appropriate epidemiology study design to use is A, retrospective cohort study, B, prospective cohort study, C, case control study, and D, cross-sectional study. And you guys are wondering, Luce, what the heck? You didn't mention this in the PowerPoint slide, but guess what? It was in your assigned readings. So, I know. Is it 100% fair? Absolutely, because you all know you got to do your readings. So, let's see what answers we have here. Mm. <laughs> Study design is not a strength for a lot of us, which myself included, okay? <laughs> okay, so the answer is case control study. Now let's read why. So case control studies group people by disease status and then investigate past exposures with the objective of identifying exposures that are more common to cases than to controls. This is an, this is an appropriate study design for this example because there are existing cases and the IP is uh, trying, not chewing, <laughs> trying to identify the exposures that are associated with the bloodstream infections. Very good. Question four, the epidemi epidemiologic triangle model for disease causation does not include which of the following? Mm, mm, very good, very good, time. That is correct, time is nowhere in our triangle, we have agent, environment, and host, right? All right, question five. Which of the following are considered primary prevention measures? Primary prevention measures, primary being in the keyword. One, barrier precautions. Two, immunizations of healthcare personnel. Three, cleaning and disinfection. And four, sterilization. <laughs> Think about this one. Put your thinking caps on, people. Very interesting. So, this one has a bit of a mixture. We have a lot of uh, different answers here, right? So, which one of these are prevention strategies to reduce the risk of transmission? So this is right when we look at our when we look at our primary prevention, this is before onset of disease, right? So the correct answer is one, two, three, and four, right? Because primary prevention strategies aim to reduce the risk of disease transmission, and all of these reduce the risk of disease transmission. Barrier precautions, immunization of our healthcare personnel. This should have been a clue right here. You should have been able to, number two, you should have already known has to be in the answer. So you could have crossed out B. So now you just have three left <laughs> um, to choose from, which is better than four. So uh, cleaning and disinfection and sterilization, all of these are primary prevention. All of these can be primary prevention. So for chapter 11, you are the IP at a small rural hospital and have been monitoring all surgical cases for infection. You want to know if your SSI rates are acceptable. What would be your best action? 
A, look for specific, look for specific high volume surgeries and compare to the published literature for each type. B, network with other local hospitals of the same size and compare your rates using a t-test. C, calculate a total SSI rate and compare to previous rates for your facility. D, review national NHSN rates and compare individual surgery types using a z-test. And SSI is surgical site infection. I'm gonna let you guys read that one again because it's a uh, it's a long one. Okay, so our correct answer is to review national NHSN rates and compare individual surgery types using a Z-test. Now, why would we do that? The goals of NHSN are to provide an estimate of the magnitude of HAIs, identify and provide data trends, assist inter and intra-hospital comparisons with risk-adjusted HAI data, help member facilities develop surveillance and analysis methods, and encourage prompt intervention to improve outcomes. NHSN is the gold standard for sharing HAI data, benchmarking for healthcare facilities, and providing validated parameters for risk models. Z-Test is a common statistical test used in infection prevention with data that is normally distributed and when the sample size is 30. Okay. Chapter 12. Question one. The medical director in one of your facility's outpatient dialysis units is requesting your assistance in investigating three cases of Clostridium difficile infection. All three patients received their treatment on the same day but at different times. You agree to assist with the investigation. An outbreak is defined as one, an infection in... Ooh, infection or event that occurs at a rate higher than expected. Two, when an unusual microbe is recognized. Three, an incidence rate that is more than two standard deviations above usual. And four, the identification of three or more cases. Really think about this one. Hmm, we have a lot of different answers in this one. I can tell we need to read that chapter again. Okay, guys, so when you're reading this, right, you need to keep in mind that outbreaks in healthcare associated infections need to be suspected when there is an adverse event. Basically, you have an increase, something about above your baseline, right? What is your baseline and is it higher than it's expected or not? Because if you regularly have, you know, I, I don't know, let's let's see. Mm. If you regularly have one serratia marcescens case in your NICUs at a hospital, one every single year, and then all of a sudden you have five in three weeks, that's above baseline, right? Um, and also, when an unusual microbe or adverse event is recognized, that would also be considered an outbreak. So really, why wouldn't the last two be considered an outbreak? An incidence rate that is more than two standard deviations above usual? First of all, Luce is not going to sit here and calculate standard deviations when it comes to outbreaks right away, right? That's not, that's not the kind of data analysis that you're going to be doing from, from the jump, from the start, right? So that's not really applicable. Not only that, but if it's just one unusual microbe, is it really going to be 
more than two standard deviations above the usual? No, because it's not even usually there. So goodbye, number three. And then number four, the identification of three or more cases, well, that one directly goes against number two, which is that if there's only one microbe, right? Yeah, just three and four, we gotta, you gotta always try to think, what do I know? What is the trap? How are they trying to get me confused, right? Okay, let's see. So Elizabeth Starney says that number three, an incidence rate relates to surveillance. Bada bing, very good, Elizabeth. And then Stephanie says, so if the microbe is not unusual, it isn't considered an outbreak. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Specifically for the APIC text, what they're telling you is that outbreaks in healthcare should be suspected when healthcare associated infections or adverse event occur above the baseline rate or the background rate or when an unusual microbe or adverse event is recognized. So an example of that would be if you're at a hospital and you have an OXA48, a VIM, an NDM, you know, some mechanism of resistance that you've never seen in your facility, that automatically would be considered an outbreak, even though you just have one case, right? You can have a usual microbe, for example, in our nursing homes, like influenza or norovirus, that can also constitute an outbreak, right? But I'm just letting you guys know, do I personally agree with everything on chapter 12 of the APIC text? Me, myself, as a person? No. But for your test, I want to make sure that you guys have that in mind, okay? Yes, yes, you can, Elizabeth. You can have an outbreak of a usual microbe. Absolutely. Right? Because if it's your usual microbe, but it's above the baseline, then that would be considered an outbreak. Remember, you just need to remember, outbreaks in healthcare facilities, is your data above baseline, and is this an unusual microbe? Okay. So our group member spotlight for today is Elizabeth Sarney from Sarasota County. So let's learn a little bit about Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth is a great participant. She's always answering questions, so shout out to you. Um, she has her BA in anthropology and an MA in applied anthropology. She also has her graduate certificate in infection control, so that is wonderful, um, especially for those of you who work for the state. If you haven't considered that, would be something to consider. Um, she has uh, her associate's degree in nursing from the State College of Florida. She's worked in Sarasota County for the past 12 years. She's worked in immunizations, employee health, and communicable diseases. So you can tell she has a lot of really great experience, which I think is going to really help her on this exam. <laughs> um, she currently works in communicable diseases, STD, and TB, and she contributes to the infection control manual. As far as her family, she's married to an FDLE officer and she has two kids, Tristan and Remy. And then some fun facts about her, she's actually a collector of mid-century modern Mexican and Danish art. So that's pretty cool. Um, I don't collect anything, so I think people who collect things are really cool. Um, that's, that's, that's an awesome hobby to have. And then her graduate thesis in archaeology um, in 1994, and then these are some of the recovered materials on display at the historic Spanish Point Hill Cottage um, that you're able to see here. So. That's a little bit about Elizabeth. So week five assignments. You guys have a quiz. Y'all have a quiz that is due by Wednesday, October 3rd at 11.45 p.m. Okay, before you take your quiz, I want to make sure that you watch a YouTube lecture on epidemiology principles and study designs, which is going to talk to you about case control cohort studies, um, making sure that you're getting exposure to that, because some of those questions, if you don't have those concepts really well understood, are going to be difficult. It is password protected. So in order for you to access the quiz, you need to make sure you put in the password, Frodo, which is my puppy's name. <laughs> Shout out to Frodo. Um, and the quiz will close on October 3rd at 11.45 p.m. sharp. So if you don't get it submitted by 11.45 p.m., then you don't get to do the quiz. I would recommend that you print out the quiz once it's done. It will show you your grade of what you scored um, so that you're actually able to see how well you did. And then your assigned chapter readings are chapters 13, 14, and 15. You have to read chapter 13. If you can't read 14 or 15, I will not be upset you need to make sure you're reading chapter 13, the use of statistics and infection prevention. It is 20 pages that are jam-packed with information 
and they will find a way to sneak this chapter into so many questions on the exam. You need to read it. You need to read it. You need to read it. So let me see if I can open up this survey for you guys so that you're able to see it. I know, I know it's a difficult chapter, which is why that is the only chapter that we're going to be doing next week. We're not going to be doing any other chapters be besides chapter 13. So you really need to make sure that you read it. So the password is going to be Frodo, capital F. And then this is what your quiz is like. It is 50 questions. I would time yourself when you're taking it. I don't have a way of timing you. Um, if I did, I would have, but this is what your what your quiz looks like it has a lot of questions i would i would really try to take no longer than an hour and 15 minutes to do it right and um, please make sure that you get it submitted and that you try to print it out okay all right so that is it for today um, does anyone have any questions about anything that we covered today? Um, I know that we didn't have a lot of questions on a lot of the chapters today, but don't worry. That is why we have a quiz, um, because I really want to make sure you guys are getting this information. Um, I did try to slow down a little bit on the questions today because um, I, I got some feedback that I, I was going a little bit too fast and people weren't having, uh, weren't having time to answer. Uh, what is the quiz about? Only on chapter 13? No. The quiz will be on chapters 10 and 11. So if you haven't read 10 and 11, I would recommend that you do so. And make sure you watch that YouTube video on study design because there will be questions here about case control, cohort studies. Um, and I want to make sure that, like right here, the investigator does not manipulate any components but simply observes characteristics and outcomes in a case control cohort observational study. Uh, approximately 1,000 individuals of varying income levels were included in a study followed by research for the next 10 years blah 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 what kind of study is it okay and so I I would just recommend that you do watch this YouTube lecture I think it will be really helpful for you for the questions and for the exam um, your quiz next week will be all on chapter 13 um, but the one for this week is just on 10 and 11 okay any other questions Oh, Carrie said the timing was great today. Okay, great. I'll be sure to slow down a little bit so that you guys all have time to read and answer questions. All right, guys. Well, I hope you guys have a wonderful Friday. Thank you so much for joining in, and um, I'll see you all next week. Bye.